Welcome in to another episode of the Yachts and Audibles podcast. Eric Scopel, Jared Mack here on another Friday morning. We've uh, now had about two practices this spring in the month of April to, to recap. We've learned some things. We had our preview podcast on Monday. We had some questions that we may have had an answer or two, but maybe not uh, have total clarity on uh, much of anything at this point, if we're being totally honest. Um, a couple fully padded practices, so that's always fun to see. It allowed the guys to kind of go out there and really challenge each other. I'm sure when you have now 31 newcomers, it's a, a good place to start. And just in terms of assessing what you have on this roster, they had obviously 28 in March. And we should note Oregon has since added Jabbar Muhammad and Evan Stewart, which we hinted at on Monday. And then also uh, Trent Ferguson, an in-state offensive lineman from Salem, has joined the mix as well. Um, as Dan said on Tuesday, anyone not here, you should be expected to join the team in the summer. But first off, Matt, uh, Jared, let's start with uh, <laughs> who, who, am I, who am I recording with today? Is this Jared or Matt? Uh, this is Jared. Who, could be either of us. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, let's start with some of the Carlos Lachlan stuff because we we teased on, on Monday's show that we would get into some of this. We do have some answers. I think there's still a lot to be determined here with what's going to happen long term, obviously. But... Um, you know, Dan Lanning spoke on Tuesday following the first practice back after a two-week break and and had a lot of things to say on the Carlos Lachlan topic, I think we should say. Um, mm -hmm. I think he did a good job of kind of straddling that line of, of making sure to credit the work that Carlos Lachlan did while he was here and, um, you know, and, and the efforts he made that they, you know, that, that those have not gone, you know, un, unappreciated on his pers from his perspective. But he also acknowledged the timing of this. Not great. I think he called it interesting, uh, which is one way of putting it. Uh, and he also said kind of there is a plan for the interim. They're going to, it sounds like, be kind of a coaching by committee operation yeah. here at running back where you'll have Koa Kai, who is a, uh, Oregon fans might know that name. He played tight end and, and I think defensive end right around when Marcus Mariota was here, another Hawaii guy. Um, he has been with the team for, I think, two or three years as a grad assistant. He will be a part of that. And then Jack Smith, I think, is an offensive analyst who will also be kind of spearheading that, but it sounds like it's going to be a bunch of different dudes helping lead this room in the interim. And we should note, Dan also said, like, we feel like we've got a, a, a kind of a well-oiled machine right now, and we're willing to just kind of play out spring without our full-time running backs coach. Like, you know, mm -hmm. he's not going to, he made it pretty clear. We're not trying to rush into a hire or anything. So um, I think I wouldn't be surprised if someone gets hired this month, but Dan made it pretty clear, like, hey, we're we're open to going through all of April with kind of this operation, which does not include a full-time replacement for Carlos Lachlan. Yeah, and I talked about that on Monday. It's like, if they find a guy that they're going to hire that they really like, sure, it'll come within the end of spring ball. But uh, I, I think they've always taken their time, and I think that's what they're going to do again. And that's basically what Dan said. He said, the urgency is getting it right. There you go. So it's not going to happen like in the next week, I don't think, unless they really find somebody that they really like and they want to hire him. But um, they're going to take their time and try to get it as, as right as possible. Uh, I thought Dan's comments on Carlos leaving were very politician. Like mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was great. We can do better. We're a great program. Like we can get somebody who's just as good, like a little shade, but not a lot of shade. But Maybe uh, the average person will read that and wouldn't think there's any shade at all. So very politician from Dan about what I expected. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see, like, I guess the running back like, coaching committee. I Again, I think it's it's spring ball. Like, you know, I don't, uh, you're going to have Dewan Riggs coming in the summer. So everybody who is in the running back room. Uh, is a running back or like Jay Harris is the only real newcomer who needs to understand, you know, what's going on at Oregon football. And at this point, um, you're not, I don't think you're getting too nitty gritty with what you're doing. Uh, you're certainly learning the playbook and things like that. But uh, I think like for fall camp, I think it would be way more important to have a full-time running back coach than uh, it is in the, what is it? The second, the first week of April. Um, so I, I think it'll be all right, but, um, I thought Dan's comments were a little interesting. I thought there was a little bit of shade thrown, but um, especially when he's like, the timing was interesting. So well, uh, it certainly was interesting. The other comment that was 
I don't know if it's shade throwing, but he did say he was a relatively unknown coach when he arrived. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. He's kind of like, kind of bragging. He's like, mm -hmm. well, he was a nobody when we found him, and now he's Ohio State's running back. So that was also I heard that and my ears kind of perked up. It's kind of it's kind of like what he does quite frequently, which is he tries to turn it into a positive of saying like, "Hey, we've done it before. We've got the ability to do it again." And as he you know said right after that, I'll, I'll just read more of this quote. And this is a great opportunity. Transitions give you opportunity to get better. So that's our goal. We're going to get better. We're going to bring someone in, that, someone in uh, who can do a really good job with the organization. So um, you've got that going. And then in terms of the timeline, there's several questions asked about it. And as we said before, uh, pretty clear they're willing to to go maybe into May or, or whatnot to, to find this. But he did also say something along the lines of we were always prepared. We have contingency plans and and uh, we already had kind of a, a list of candidates or names that we would know. So it's possible that they're yeah, they could turn this around short, you know, quicker than yep. than, than than slower. But we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I don't have I haven't heard like, hey, expect to hear something in the next week, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with the running back room right now, I, I I think everybody intends to be here. You know, I think we've seen a couple of people. I just wanted to address this because we've seen people ask it. Um, all the running backs have been at Thursday's practice. They were all at Tuesday's practice. Um, I know there's a concern when a position coach leaves. I brought it up with Demetrius Martin. Like, hey, Nico Reed basically came to Oregon because of Demetrius Martin. He went to Colorado first, then he followed him to Oregon. Maybe, maybe he'd follow him to Michigan State. That has not happened yet. And it seems that that won't be the case at running back either. I wouldn't be... I guess totally shocked or stunned if one of these guys that Coach Lachlan recruited follows him to Ohio State at some point. Um, but everybody's still at practice doing their thing, and uh, that's right there's pretty good news because I know there's always concern about um, you know departures when a coach does leave, like like Carlos did, especially with the kind of strange timing of it all. So um, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, we we talked about this on Monday too. It's like if you're Jordan James and you go to Ohio State's running back room, like great. You're going to be the third string running back. You're going to be behind Judkins and behind Travion Henderson. Like, there's no reason for these guys to go. And if you know Whittington, again, yeah, no, great. You're the third string running back instead of the second string running back. Or not, you know, like, I guess Noah Whittington is competing for a starting spot here, even though I think Jordan James is the clear number one. But he's still out there on the field competing. Um, that wouldn't really be the case at Ohio State. And it's also his last year of college eligibility. So, like, you really want to transfer once again, like, I think if you're concerned about who potentially could transfer, it's the younger guys. It's a guy like Jay Lamar. It's a guy like uh, Dewan Riggs, who I just mentioned, who have years of eligibility, who were recruited by Carlos Lachlan. Um, but if you look at Lamar, he's from Washington. Like, there's a th there's a connection there. It's not the East Coast connection, and Riggs hasn't even arrived on campus yet. So, uh, I'd be surprised. Again, anything can happen. It's a transfer portal era. You know, Jordan James could be gone tomorrow, but I'd be very surprised if he were. One thing I know, Whittington, because I thought I thought he was a senior too, but I had my roster right in front of me. I looked down at it. He's listed as a redshirt junior, so I wonder if they froze his eligibility clock last year because he was hurt. Um, that's something to I'll have to ask him. Update. And he on only played in four games. Yeah, so maybe that's what I, I don't know. I just noticed it right now as you said it because I was like, yeah, he's a senior, and then it said he's a redshirt junior, so maybe he has two years. Um, and we maybe should know. With, no. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, maybe that's the reason he leaves now. Um, yeah. Uh, well, and actually, that kind of is a nice transition point here um, from the running back room, unless you had any kind of final thoughts on no. Lachlan, no. on candidates. Yeah, I don't really either. Um, we'll keep you up, everybody updated here. We'll have a running back big board up, I think, sometime probably this weekend. Uh, now that that news is finalized, just with some names to, to know. And, and, of course, we, we know from – Past experience, Dan oftentimes hires people that you just have you would have no idea of. Like this person is somehow a, a candidate, so we'll, we will mm -hmm. see what happens there. But the Noah Whittington part, I think, is a good transition because two fully padded practices this week. Noah was in pads at both practices. I couldn't tell you everything he did, to be honest with you, Jared, because we watched so little of the practice. But it seems like he's like logging close to a full workload, at least when we're watching, which is. Super encouraging. Um, in general, I think the availability of players has been encouraging. I think the only player we know for sure is out. Well, a couple of the true freshmen we assume probably are, AJ Pugliano being one of them. But 
Julio Florence, I, I think we got a little bit of an update. He has not practiced uh, Tuesday or Thursday or the March practices. I don't think this is a huge surprise for people who play pay attention closely. He was rather dinged up to end last season, did not play, I think, in the bowl game, the Pactal Championship game, and maybe the Oregon State game. I think he missed like either last <clears throat> – Did not play in the Oregon State game. Okay, so I think he missed the last three weeks um, or so of the season. Um, and it, it sounds like, though, he might be able to participate a little bit here jared uh at the end of spring yeah uh it was a good update from chris hampton on uh on thursday he said i'll give you the full quote here we may get some out of him meaning florence later on in the spring uh he's out there now he's doing through some walkthrough stuff with us but that's about it right now but i think the rehab is going pretty good and after talking to chief and talking to jaleel he's in a much better space than he was about a month ago so i expect we may be able to get some out of him in the spring encouraging um he clearly had a, like a lower leg injury uh it happened against arizona state i remember uh being in, in tempe and watching that game and um seeing julio florence go like for the opening kickoff in the second half and then kind of limp towards the sideline i'm like oh, that's not great after playing the first half and then lo and behold next week against oregon state he was on crushes and then i don't remember when it was probably in december there was he posted on social media that like you know, his leg was like in a cast that he clearly just got surgery on. So yeah, that was a pretty good indication of what was happening uh, at that time period. So, and we saw him around the facilities with a leg brace on. So another clear indicator of what was going on, but um, it seems like he's doing well. He's making good improvements. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with Noah Whittington. Like, I don't know where he is uh, like a percent wise, Um and I don't know if we will find that out during the spring. I think it'd be really encouraging if he did suit up for practice. Um, and it kind of goes to my point about the running back room where it's spring ball. It's not as intense as, as it is during fall ball. Like they could they could get him out there. They could throw him in a red non-contact jersey just like they did with a couple cats during the March practices and just see how he feels physically cutting, running, you know, doing football things. So I think it's certainly positive news. I think that was the biggest, one of the biggest concerns, excuse me, uh, for Oregon going forward into the 2024 season was what's the cornerback room rotation going to look like and will Julio Florence be healthy enough to impact that? Um, I think signs are pointing towards, yes, he will be healthy enough to impact that, but, um, you know, it's all going to be just how his body responds to, you know, the ramp up and, and um, being able to do things over the next couple of weeks. So, Oh, no, I think it was a positive thing. I'm surprised Chris Hampton told us. I think that was uh, maybe the most surprising thing out of all of this is he was very, uh, very candid with what he told us. So I always appreciate that. Um, but, yeah, no, I think all, all in all, I think it was a good response and a, a good update. And to your point about it being surprising, I agree, because in theory, most programs have like a head coach is the only one to discuss injuries or those sort of situations from like a personnel perspective. So to have Hampton offer that update and not just defer and say, oh, I'll, I'll let Dan provide the, I think James asked the question of like, hey, is, is it possible if Florence does anything? Mm -hmm. I would have anticipated, or I kind of anticipated he would have been like, oh, that's up to coach. Uh, he, Jill, Jill is doing well, but that, that, I'll let coach provide the update as opposed to him providing. So I don't know. I thought that was kind of notable, but it was a good update. And, and to your point, I, I think you feel encouraged that he'll be at least by fall camp, somebody who is hopefully ready to go. And that's, that's several months away from now. And then the start of the season right. available to start, but you never know with these things and it, it takes one flare up or, or one, you know, uh, re injury, re aggravation of the injury. And, and mm -hmm. we're looking at another, a totally different window where he misses time. And, and he did have, a very strong season in 23 when he was healthy, but there were, it wasn't always the case. I and mean, we had that leg injury, but I think he also dealt with like yeah. a shoulder, shoulder injury or something were, that he yeah, there were suffered earlier bunch. in the year. Yeah. So. I mean, he left the game against Washington. I think he left mm -hmm. the game against somebody else. If my memory serves me correct, there was, Cal, there was I think, some, I think Cal was one of the games he left. Yeah. Yeah. There were always uh, little injuries here and there for him. So, I think, you know, getting healthy is going to be a huge part of his development, his prospectus in the future. Like, it's going to be important, obviously, going into this year. But, you know, he's going to do with these nagging injuries eventually at one point. And then two other Ducks who are not at practice but not due to injury but because they're playing other sports. Bryce Betcher kind of focusing on baseball right now. Jared, I'll let you kind of 
maybe speak to some of Bryce's baseball exploits because why not provide a mini baseball update and maybe kind of what his plan is. And then Rod Pleasant, who was sure. one, who was one of the top sprinters in the 2023 prep sprinting class, is is focused on track and field. And I don't know if we'll see him really at all in spring. I think he is he is dialed in to trying to run as close to 10 second in the 100 meters, which he is very capable of doing. I think his PR is like 10.09 or 10.07 or something absurd. So mm -hmm. um, no Rod, no Bryce. Um, Jared, do you know like roughly what Bryce is thinking for football? Like is this is he is he going to keep playing or is he just focused on baseball in the spring? Yeah, so I, I asked him pre-baseball season, I think it was, and it seemed like it was going to go half and half. I think I even asked Waz, and he's like, yeah, no, we're going to have him out here. Dan's going to have him out there, and uh, it's going to be a great relationship. And then he went into like this really detailed relationship about him and Dan. It was fun. But <laughs> uh, I originally anticipated it would be similar to what we saw last season, yeah. where it was kind of like a real 50-50. Uh, the difference this year is that Bryce is good and is uh, the everyday starting center fielder and has been for – the better part of the entire season uh I, I don't like other than like a day off like a rest day i don't and when he was injured like i don't think bryce has been out of the lineup at all he's also hitting 320 he's getting on base a lot <laughs> like he's playing a really good defensive center field so um i don't think the football program needs bryce as much as the baseball program needs bryce so i think that's going to make the final decision and like last year it was it was really 50 50 because um, you know, Oregon had a lot of outfielders, you know, Tanner Smith and Colby Shade and Riku Nishida. Like they weren't, Bryce Butcher was not playing other than a defensive replacement. So during the day, yeah, no, go play football. But, you know, he's he's down in Los Angeles tonight <clears throat> preparing for the series against UCLA. Like he's not, he's not going to be at football tomorrow. Like he might have been uh, a season ago. So I think that's pretty, pretty obvious, at least at this point. Um, and for, Roderick, I have no idea how he's doing, but that's going to be a decision he's going to have to make one day. And I'll, I'll be interested to see what it is, whether he tries to go full time track or full time football. But I think, regardless, I think he'll be really good at, at one of the two. Yeah, he's the closest thing to a Devin Allen we've seen at Oregon um, since, uh, in terms of being somebody who's legitimately has professional track and professional football aspirations. And, you know, the football part, I think, is maybe less clear just because it's some, a little bit more competitive and, and there's certainly a lot more corners that he'll have to compete with to make a football roster in the NFL. But from a track perspective, this kid can run sub 10, which he seems like he's a well on his way of doing. I think that's going to be a hard thing to not devote your attention to. Like representing your country in the Olympics is, is something that maybe he's capable of doing if he's able to run sub 10, you know, I mean, those are the sort of times you're looking at. So I think this will be a, maybe a really telling spring for him in terms of how he performs on the track. I haven't, I think he's run twice or once they've had a couple of meets. Um, I yeah, don't know no, what those times have been. Yeah. Go ahead and see if you can find what he's run so far, but uh, I'll be curious to see with him what, yeah, to your point, Jared, does he try to pull the Devin Allen and do both sports, which you could do. I mean, the fall, there's no conflicts really for track. Um, mm -hmm but you are missing most of spring or probably all of spring just to focus on, on sprinting. Is it, is, is, is that going to put him behind the eight ball as so to speak with, with football, is that going to make it difficult for him to really actually progress and, and, and get better because these are pivotal months, especially for a young corner to miss. I just think it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what decision he ultimately winds up making, but a really talented football player who, who I think everybody was, was encouraged by when we saw him in limited snaps last year. But the other part is Oregon's, and we can maybe transition over to the next bit here in a second, mm -hmm. um, talking about the defensive back room. But um, Jared, any any luck? What do you got? Yeah, um, Rod has only run the sixty meter dash this year. He's run okay. it three times, um, and his career best looks like it's a six six nine in the New Mexico Don Kirby Invitational. For those who are familiar, uh, I'm not sure where that ranks. Uh, that it's not. Fourth, he, came in, he came in fourth place. The fastest was six five four. So he's a little bit away. But again, true freshman. So we'll see. That's yeah. Those are that's not an absolute blazing time. That that's like if you want to be running like sub six four. If you're like 
super, super fast, I think, in the 60 from my experience. I've watched a lot more outdoor track than the indoor um, where they run the 60. Yeah, the so. 60 always seems silly to me, but well, I don't make the rules. You don't make the rules. Um, okay, uh, let's – I'm trying to think. There were – oh, there's one other thing I wanted to bring up on, on the availability front before we move on to um, some news on the defensive back room because we did speak with Chris Hampton and I think learned some – Kind of interesting things I find interesting. We'll see what the what the listeners think. Um, but Jackson Jones, the outside linebacker, who according to Tosh Lupoy could be maybe an inside linebacker, uh, was in uniform for both practices this week, which is uh, which was new. He was not in March, and he did spend I think almost all of Thursday's practice working with some some rehab guys there. So if there's a high school injury he's working back from. I don't know if he's somebody who's going to make a huge impact this fall. I would guess not, but. Just wanted to kind of provide an update there since he's new on campus and uh, and we were able to see him. Is, is there anything else from the availability or what we've seen in practice? Or maybe we can just touch on that stuff at the end. I guess we could have some initial thoughts on Evan Stewart and Jabbar Muhammad, which I don't even know what we're basing that off of other than like right. what they look They're like there. walking in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I don't have I – mean, other than like Gage Hurek being a punter listed as a kicker on the roster. but. Yeah. Nobody, nobody cares about that. So. All right, let's let's move on to uh, the more concrete information from Coach Hampton, and then at the end we'll maybe do like just like a back and forth on here are some small nuggets yeah. we learned that are potentially sure. interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I I did think this was kind of notable that Oregon has not had a strictly defensive backs coach, and what I mean by that is that they're coaching all the defensive back positions. I think since John Neal. Um, and that would have been back uh, when when Helfrich was here. So we're talking maybe close to a decade. Um, they've almost always since, ex- I shouldn't say almost, they have exclusively since split it up where you have a safeties coach and you have a corners mm-hmm. coach. And that was the case last year where Chris Hampton was the safeties coach, Demetrius Martin was the corners coach. And with Demetrius leaving, they've decided to go to a one defensive back coach, uh, I guess, situation. They've up, um, elevated Brian Michalowski to coach inside linebackers, which did not have a designated assistant coach previously under Coach Landing. Um, and so the staff structure on defense is is significantly different than it was a year ago. And we talked to Coach Hampton about that and, and kind of what their approach is. And just to I'll run through this pretty quick, but you know, he and Rashad Wadud, who is basically the team's corners coach, despite being um, a grad assistant or an analyst, I don't actually know. I get confused on whose titles are what, basically, with these analysts and, and, and grad assistants. Yeah. They feel kind of interchangeable to me. I know they aren't, um, but Rashad's one of those. And then Antonio Parks and Connor Boyd, according to Coach Hampton, are also helping with the safety. So there's there's four guys in that meeting room, which is important because there's like probably 20-plus guys in that room from a player perspective. Um, that room is including the, all the safeties, all the corners, and all of the stars, which is kind of that hybrid position. So – it's a different approach from what we've seen at Oregon recently. It is nothing new, though, to Coach Hampton, which is a, which is the part I wanted to get into. I thought was sort of interesting, um, which is that he has basically operated from this this kind of situation exclusively throughout his career. He said he did this at McNeese State, he did this at Tulane, both as a position coach, and then even when he was the full time defensive coordinator, um, I asked him if this was his preference, and he said, "quote Yes, if you ask me honestly, this would be my preference." You could do it both ways. I've done it both. But if you ask me preferably, I'd rather do it this way. So we're actually maybe in a situation that uh, will benefit the defensive back room more than the setup was last year, just because if if this is the way Coach Hampton likes to operate, then maybe it's a good thing that this is the way it's it's working out. So, um, again, I know this is like kind of inside baseball stuff here where we're talking about meeting rooms, which maybe fans don't really care about. But I did think it was kind of interesting that uh, this is the way that they're operating. You know, typically in the past, you'd have your corners in one room and you'd have your safeties in one room and maybe you'd have your stars with both or in one room uh, of mm-hmm. their own. But now we've got one room with probably, again, 20, 25 players uh, led by basically one full time on field assistant in Chris Hampton. So a lot of responsibility there for him. Um, but as he said, this is the way he kind of likes to operate. And I'm really excited to see how all this comes together for him. Cause as, as we've said here, maybe not enough. I, I think he's absolutely one of the rising stars on this staff. And when we talk about coaches who would be attractive to be hired elsewhere, similar to coach Lachlan Hampton's right at the top of that list as somebody who would be either a full-time defensive coordinator or shoot, maybe at a smaller school, somebody who 
could be a head coach because I just think I think I think very highly of the way he operates mm-hmm. and carries his business and, and Dan seems to feel the same way. Uh, and his paychecks say the same thing. That's why he's paid over a million dollars a year uh, to keep him as the de- as the co defensive coordinator. Um, yeah, I mean, I I too, if I were Chris Hampton, would like the complete control of everything that goes on in the secondary room. So I think um, I think that's certainly why he likes it. Uh, I can see why just having like almost kind of like kind of less guys but like you said there's still like three or four assistant coaches who are on this with with Hampton and would do but uh it's still like having less coaches have it's gonna sound weird less of a say I'm sure certainly helps where he can he can kind of control what he wants and he's a really good defensive mind you can go back to his two lane numbers and when he took over as defensive coordinator that pass defense got yeah uh, and uh, like way 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 better just increasingly better across the board and the same thing with Oregon you know he comes on last year for his first first full season and Oregon secondary does a lot better and that could be because of improved talent across the board which certainly helps but scheme just schematics in general uh philosophy just t- that's the the teaching on the field um, there's a lot of changes that he brought, and I'm interested to see what are what are more of those changes. Um, but I agree with you, Eric. Like he's certainly a rising star, and he made a really interesting decision to go from Tulane's DC to be the safeties coach here. But now he's co-defensive coordinator. Now he's making over a million dollars a year. So um, I think he's certainly a rising star. And I think any like mid-major school would be, you know high on his tail and trying to try to hire him as a head coach. But um, if you're Oregon, you want to keep him around as long as possible. So um, we'll see what, where that ends, but that's obviously, you know, a, a topic for potentially a much different day uh, for, for spring camp. I'm excited to see what he does. And especially with the plethora of talent, like I wrote about um, Oregon cross training and how he was like, Oh, the new guys will learn eventually old guys they know now so it's like all right cool there's not a lot of information but in the in the exercise i did go through like the cornerback and the safety room there's a lot of talent in there and it's just getting almost better by the by the year in terms of who they're bringing in for recruits uh and this 2024 class was uber talented after getting the 2023 class with Broderick pleasant dale and austin a couple other guys where um a lot of us thought that that was pretty darn talented so and then obviously landing Muhammad and Cam Alexander, like they're that safety room, that cornerback room, star room, like that's there's a lot of talent in there. And I'm very interested to see what Chris Hampton does as, along with Rashad would do of like how they balance that out, how they get as many dudes out of the field as possible who are talented. Um, they're just gonna have talent at their fingertips whenever they want. So um, interesting room, interesting dynamic, but excited to see where it goes. <laughs> And we were supposed to get, we should note, Taishim Johnson right after Chris Hampton. And I would have just been curious to hear from a defensive back, like what that difference has meant. Maybe not specifically for him, because he was probably working in that same room. Maybe a corner would have been someone who'd been fun to talk mm-hmm. to. We'll get that later this spring. But just to get a feel for what this is going to be like um, going forward. And hey, Jared, maybe at some point in the summer, like in July, when there's not a whole lot to talk about, we'll do like a uh, a draft of Oregon's assistant coaches and who would be the most attractive to be hired away from another school because i would probably have hampton in that top tier of guys Um, yeah no we'll we'll uh make a graphic and set it out to all the all the universities as well just be like hey guys this is this is what what we think we're interested to see what you think who you would hire Um, yeah see if we get commission out of it yeah see if we get some commission on there finders finders fee yeah yeah we told you this guy was great. Now you hired him, yeah. and you hired him for one and a half million dollars. We deserve three percent of that paycheck. Um, yes, please. It, anyway, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a whole lot else on the defensive back um, kind of setup. I, I did think he was really high on all of the portal additions. I think Kobe Savage was the one we probably asked him the least about, but we did ask about Jabbar. We did ask about Cam Alexander. Um, both of those players, he has. A lot of nice things to say, I and mean, I think Alexander, the, the the key was just the speed and the change. He talked a lot about change of direction, and that it, its importance there. I and mean, that was something he highlighted with Cam Alexander with Jabbar. It was really talented and one heck of a competitor. Like you know, he said that when they spoke to his high school coaches, his coaches at Oklahoma State, his coaches at Washington, 
I did think it was interesting that they talked to people at Washington about this because I'm sure this was uh, probably not where Washington's uh, coaching staff wanted him to go. But uh, they had some conversations, it sounds like, and, and everybody just loved the way he competes and, and the effort he puts in and how hard of a worker he is. And, and you do get a sense of like just how Coach Hampton talks about different players. I, I, I got the sense that they're really excited about Jabbar. Um, and I can't really blame him uh, for being I mean, the player we saw on the field in the, in the two games against Oregon last year in particular was a really, really good player. And at times, one of the best players on a field, which included a ton of offensive talent for Oregon and a ton of defensive talent yeah. for Washington. So this is a player to be really excited about. Um, let's just kind of spitball a couple, couple of things maybe we've heard or seen. Um, uh, I think I'll start with, uh, you know, I, I guess – it was funny how Tez Johnson described Evan Stewart. This is like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny how Tez Johnson described everybody physically, to be honest, because he he called he said Evan Stewart was short, and Jeremiah McCle Jeremiah McClellan was chubby, which he then yeah. backed off and said, I think he said like thick or something like that, because I think mm -hmm. I've seen Jeremiah McClellan. He is a broader person. I don't think he's like has a belly or anything. I don't think he's, yeah, he's not carrying chubby. Yeah, like he. <laughs> I know what Chubby looks like. I look in the mirror. I see him. I'm like, that guy's got abs. I think I think we're a different types of types of body types, Tez. But um, I just thought that was kind of funny from a Tez perspective, what he he saw with Evan Stewart. Uh, we have seen so little of Evan Stewart that I don't really even have an evaluation. Like I, the extent of what I've watched is him return a couple of punts um, on, with no coverage team. We should note, and he mm -hmm. looks he caught the football and he looked explosive running with the football. So good sure, early. Man. Good early assessments, but that's really all I've got. Uh, I have even less probably on Jabbar, who um, I've like watched do some, I don't know, like try to force a fumble drills, but that's yeah, some kinda, punch out kinda, drills kinda, like that's it. So um, I don't have a ton. I wish we could be like, yeah, and then Evan and Jabbar were going one on one, and we watched he, he crushed him with his post corner route, and but we don't we don't have that kind of stuff for from that perspective. But um, I, I I couldn't help but chuckle at how Tez was describing his. His fellow receivers he was very high on evan's talent as well but aside from maybe suggesting he's shorter than he thought he would be um so that was that was interesting um josh connerly was pretty dang high on jaquan mcroy's physical tools and just like he kind of compared him to what he was when he was a true freshman a couple of years ago of needing time to learn everything but just physically you saw like even in practice i don't th i think he said he could pick a specific moment but just like, yeah, there's some stuff he does where you go, okay, that's that's different. He's just a big, big kid. Um, and his kind of eyes lit up. I always kind of look at the, the way that they, um, I guess, receive the question. You could tell he, when he heard that name, he was like, yeah, that's been a guy who's who's kind of stood out to me as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else from the players because, frankly, the players' assessments are going to be a lot more interesting than ours because it's just going to be being, being like, yeah, Jericho Johnson is a really big person and Amari Washington also yeah, looks boy. really big. Um, so that's what, is there anything else, Jared, that stood out from, from any of that? Oh, I guess one thing, Jared, was, was that, uh, that we, I guess we got kind of a sense of the place kicking hierarchy more than like, I guess. Sort yeah. Of. Yeah, I guess. Um, it was on a Tuesday. There was a fireman drill for Oregon where they uh, go from one side of the field to the other. They're all running. Dan is screaming into the mic, counting down for 15 seconds. It's quite alarming if you're walking by. Um, <laughs> but it was Grant Meters who, took yeah. the place kick and hit a field goal from probably 35 or 38 yards. Um, but wasn't Atticus Sappington, Sappington contrary to reports, wasn't uh, Andrew Boyle, wasn't anybody else. It was Grant Meter. So I thought that was certainly interesting. Do I know if that means anything? No. I'm sure the next time it'll be Atticus Sappington. But certainly interesting. Uh, I do like it. Um, I do like to see Grant out there because he's like – He's the heir. He's the predecessor to Cam Camden Lewis, so mm -hmm. that's why they brought him on. Um, but we'll see if that really sticks or makes a big difference. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything from the Tuesday player interviews where they kind of got into what one of the yeah. newcomers looked like, because that's always like the fun thing to do right about now. Um, I, 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 I don't... T Ferg, T, T Ferg said, I know he's not a newcomer, but Kenyon Sadiq, he said he's like the the fastest player on the field at all times. And there's some really fast guys here. So that was kind of one of those, oh, that's 
encouraging to hear a positive thing about mm -hmm. Kenyon, who who had some no nice moments last year. Like notably, he caught um, Bo Nix's record breaking touchdown pass in the bowl game, but he only played. I think we looked at it. He played like maybe it's not eight, a lot. He played like eighty snaps maybe, and like I think twenty of them came after non conference play. So. He, he really didn't play a lot towards the end of the season. So it was good to hear from Ferg that he's somebody that stood out, but I'm with you. I don't, I'm not, not a lot of stuff's jumping out here from, from a younger guy um, perspective. Hampton was really high on Dale and Austin. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was interesting. I think it was Jared Denny of on three who asked uh, the Dale and Austin question. Uh, and Hampton said, He's really, really fired up about his development and how he's getting better and better. So, I like I like the 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 idea of Dalen Austin as a corner because he's six foot two. He's like two hundred pounds. Um, there's a lot like like I like I talked about. There's a lot of talent in that room, but um, I'm the highest on Dalen in terms of that 2023 class, and I think he's the guy who could really give some issues to not issues, but really give the coaching staff some stuff to think about about where he's going to play. Hampton also mentioned that he was playing star. So yeah. for anybody who was saying, hey, maybe he's playing free safety, he's not. He won't. Um, Sorry. Yeah. That was that, that was, was a, that was a, that was a suggestion that maybe he could there play were, there. You weren't you were not the only person. Um every time I would post the the defensive two deep, someone would be like, Oh, what about Dale and Austin at star? It's like, no, you don't move a six foot two corner. Um, so maybe they're gonna move him to star. So we'll see. Uh, but I was encouraged to hear that from Hampton. Um, again, Gage here is punting, which cool. Um, and then the kick and punt returners are like the same every week. So if you read the practice report, there's there's no difference every week. As you would say, that's a uh, copy and paste probably for for the, <laughs> for the list. Uh, I did have one thing maybe to wrap on that was interesting, just from a defensive strategy perspective. Maybe I know we're way out. Um, but, you know, Dan has now asked, or Dan, James has now asked. It'd be weird if Dan was in the scrum asking questions. I'd appreciate that. Um, it would, would be interesting. Our good friend James asked both Tosh Lupoy back in March and now Chris Hampton on, on Thursday about playing more dime, which would incorporate yeah. more, more of their cornerbacks. And the way I, you know, the way, you know, when I think about this offseason and how aggressive they were in, in recruiting cornerbacks, especially when they returned Julio, they returned. Nico, they return Dante, they return uh, Rod Pleasant and Dalen Austin. Uh, they bring in Sione Lalalu, so, sorry, Sione Lalea, uh, the top Juco corner in the country. They bring in Dakota Fields, and if they Obadegu will, you know, he will join the team in the summer. That's a lot of highly regarded corners. But mm -hmm. you think about the idea of maybe, maybe you're going to have a chance to get three or four of those guys on the field at times if you're playing certain personnel packages. And, and part of me, I know Hampton also said like we had in, we had issues with injuries last year. We wanted to ha kind of cover our bases a little bit more there because both Jaleel and Kai Reaver were really in and out of the lineup the whole last two months or so of the season. I would say, mm -hmm. but yep. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that that's something to maybe keep an eye on. I don't know if we'll see it in the spring really at all, but when we get into the non-conference part of the season of just like maybe we're going to see a situation where, where you, you just are out there and you're going like, oh, Dante Manning is is also out here and so is Dalen Austin along with starting corners, Julio Florence and Jabbar Muhammad or whatever it ends up being. Like yeah. I could just see a scenario where they would want to take advantage of having all that depth, that corner. And because frankly, like I, I think they've got like four or five guys that I think are starting caliber corners on this roster and, and you've got to find a way to, to get as many of those guys out there as possible. So um, that was something that kind of my ears perked on or uh, when, when, when Chris and Tosh talked about it. Yeah, I always, I always love a team that runs dime, but this feels like the the wrong year to try to run it. Um, just because of the, the conference? Yeah, yeah, maybe. If, you guys, if they could have ran dime last year, that would have been sweet because you're going against Michael Penix. You're going against Caleb Williams. You're going against all these great quarterbacks and a lot of spread offenses. But – you know, a dime puts another uh, defensive back on the field and takes out a linebacker. So that's, that's why it's dime. Um, you're just taking out a lot of a lot of beef, and you're putting in more secondary guys. Who, again, I think they're they're like Oregon's my projected starting defensive backs are all good downhill hitters. Like they can go get somebody in open space. But um, you know, when you're going against Michigan or Ohio State or Michigan State, like these are big boys who are going to probably try to establish a run, especially Jonathan Smith and Michigan State. So you're going to want all the beef out there that you can get. Um, 
So again, it'll come in handy if it's a third down and long situation if they can throw another defensive back. Don't get me wrong, I'm all about it, but uh, it just feels like their standard uh, nickel look is more like what they what it's going to look like more often than not. I think Dime is, yeah, it's more like a specialty package. So maybe I'm making too big of a deal out of it, but yeah, I wasn't I suggesting I, I, it's not going to be their base package. Just to no, be no, no. I, and I know that. I just feel like, um, like it's a, there's it might be because of James. There's a lot of talk about it, and I'm like, I don't know how often they're going to put that in there, Jim. Like, it's going to be, it's going to be a real specialty package, and they pulled it off in 2022, um, and that was like the last time I really remember them running it a lot. And I don't anticipate them doing it as a base package in any real game. Uh, I think it's just going to be a specialty one, which is cool. It's fun. It's different, but it's not. I, I, it, I'll be excited to see it, but I'm not like, oh, yeah, no, this is what they're going to run all the time. Don't expect that. If you're expecting them to run dime all the time, I, I wouldn't expect it. No, no, I, I, I tend to agree with that. I, I just think from a personnel perspective, there there are a lot of intriguing defensive backs, and to get as many yeah. of those guys out there they as have, possible is exciting. Um, they have the ability to do it now. They do. They have the ability to do it, and we'll see from a – from a personnel perspective, we'll see when that actually comes to fruition, when that's of use. Um, you make a good point in terms of the conference. There, there certainly aren't constructed – there are many offenses constructed the way they were in the Pac-12. Um, I would imagine Washington, Jed Fish, that's going to be a game where, yeah, maybe that will come in to play mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, UCLA, I don't actually know exactly what that offense is going to look like. I have like. no There's idea. A completely different leadership. There, if Chip Kelly was still the coach, I'd say that could be a weekend where maybe you see a little bit of that. So, no, there, there, uh, you bring up a good point in terms of it, this isn't something that is going to be used every week. But as you also kind of said, and the point we're, we're kind of making is they do have the players now. It sounds like, and they're going to experiment with using it a little bit, and, and we'll just have to see how frequent they go and, and turn to to playing a little bit of dime. But when you have as many quality corners, and it kind of remains to be seen at safety. I think there is some value to, to mixing it up and putting more of those guys out there. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else from the first two practices of the uh, second first week of spring? No. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I don't have anything. All right. I don't really have anything either. We'll uh, We'll do another one of these podcasts sometime next week, recapping what the second week looks like. Um, We'll also next week speak with more uh, coaches. We should know, we'll also be speaking with Junior Adams and some student athletes on Saturday morning. Um, next week, I'm guessing we'll probably get Dan and then maybe some more of the assistant coaches and, and student athletes. I there was a, a whisper that Dylan Gabriel might be available at some point next week, which would be fun to talk to uh, him about. And we've got a couple of pieces of content on the site. Um, his teammates and, and coaches seem to be very high on Dylan, but it'll be good to to chat with him um, for the first mm-hmm. time next week. But for uh, Jared Mack, this has been Eric Scopel signing off from the Otson Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.